This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We are blessed with majestic mountains, beautiful forests, rivers, and a spectacular wild coastline, all 19,000 kilometres of it. I'm Craig Potton, and like many New Zealanders, I actually learnt to swim not long after I could walk. I'm a photographer, a conservationist, and a surfer, and I just love the coast. I like exploring above it and in the water. On my coastal journeys, I'll encounter some wonderful sea creatures. I'll visit people that care for the coast, and I'll try to understand its place in our culture and our duty of care for it. The top of the North Island on its east coast has a fair share of distant wild shores, but many of its beaches are crowded and threatened with overuse. In the next hour, we'll travel from White Island in the Bay of Plenty up the coast to some magical places, finishing at Paringaringa Harbour in the far north. More than two-thirds of New Zealanders come here to play, to swim, to fish, to sail and to live. So this is New Zealand's crowded coast, where we come to get away from it all, but risk bringing it all with us. It's a place where humans and nature collide, and nature often loses. Yet among this tangle of coastal development, some of nature's wonders still survive. And one of these is at Miranda, at the base of the Coromandel Peninsula. Humans have lived on this coast for about 800 years, but godwits have been coming here for thousands. And the godwits are about to leave for their Alaskan breeding grounds. And I'm hoping to be lucky enough to see some of them go. There is something about godwits. I guess they look pretty drab to us. Uh, most of the time they're down here, they're sort of dull brownish grey colour and they're sort of poking around in the mud and you know, they're fairly wary. So you, you think, well, you know, what, what's, what's so special about these guys? But then you, you look at what they do, uh, it's just, they're just astonishing. Through satellite tracking in recent years, it's been confirmed that birds are, are leaving New Zealand and flying directly to the Yellow Sea coast of China or Korea. Uh, without stopping. So that's, that's over 10,000 kilometres in just over seven days. Seven days? Of, of non-stop powered flight. But that's bloody exhausting, isn't it? Indeed. You can see there's a broad corridor that they're following up into the Yellow Sea where they refuel, and then when they're ready to go, off they go out across Korea, across Japan, out in the Pacific, and then up into Alaska. That's the journey up, and the other one's the journey back down, is it? Yeah. And that looks different. This is the longest flight known among birds, this, this non-stop flight from Alaska back to New Zealand. You know, that's over 11,000 kilometres. And that immense flight back to these feeding grounds will take just eight and a half days. And what also amazes me, having watched albatrosses, even watching gannets, is they do a thing called dynamic soaring, where they don't flap their wings. Yeah, totally different wing structure, although well, similar wing structures to some of the seabirds, but it is powered flapping flight the whole way. As they leave, they won't form the familiar V-shaped flight that we often see in travelling birds, but a shallow curve to protect each other from the winds they will meet on their journey. Incredibly, godwits instinctively know when their breeding grounds will be clear of snow and ready to welcome them. The birds of the more southern Alaskan breeding grounds will leave first. Those going to the icier north will wait a little longer. The hoary question is, how do they know where they're going? I mean, they've not got GPS, yeah. they've not got... Well, they don't have a GPS as we understand it, but we know that they follow celestial clues, they follow the star map, they've got a star compass, they've got a sun compass, they've got some sort of internal timekeeping mechanism that, that can presumably track the sun for wherever they are. In a nutshell, they've got a number of compasses which appear to be calibrated against each other at different stages of the journey. So here we've got a bunch of godwits that are pretty well advanced in their departure preparations. We've got a mixture of males and females. Can I have a look? Yeah, take yep. a look. So the males are a lot smaller. They're the ones that colour up the most. So those smaller, red, very brightly coloured birds out there are males. The females don't colour up quite so much. They get quite a bit of barring. But you can also see that those, some of those birds are very fat. Uh, they're just rotund all the way. Just big bundles of lard. And it's this lard that keeps them fueled and hydrated for this staggering journey. 
Without the abundant feeding grounds like these at Miranda, the Godwits couldn't make their epic flight. So they're a little bit agitated, possibly because we're here, maybe, or is that just their high roosting sort of No, behavior? but at this time of year, there is a, an edge of excitement. I mean, you, you hear them calling a lot more, and immediately just before departure, there is some, quite a lot of chatter. When are you predicting these guys will go? Well, we've, we've had some departures already oh. this, this season, uh, but really over the next week or so there'll be more. And by the end of March, most of the birds that are going will have gone. They're definitely starting to move. Yeah, no, just keep an eye on this, these birds here. Yep. See the way those birds are starting to separate from the flock. And you can just hear by the sound, this might yes. be it. They yes. might actually yes. be going. This, this looks like it might be a departure. Extraordinary. How can you tell? Yeah, just, just, just that initial chatter. We've learned to listen for these. Oh. We've got about 40 odd birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 40 odd birds in that flock. Yep, that's definitely a departure. <laughs> that's stunning. They, they are going now yes. all the way to China. All the way to the Yellow Sea. I'm absolutely stunned. I mean, I've just observed one of the most fundamental, extremely wonderful things in nature, which is a fact. That little group there won't stop till it gets way up in China on a peninsula. And even then it'll only stop for a few weeks, feed up, and then fly another 6,000 kilometres to, well, all the way across to Alaska. And some of these birds, the old birds, are you know, 10, 15, 20 years old. They've done it quite a few times. Enough information, Keith. I mean, this is <laughs> phenomenal. This is something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, it's pretty special. <laughs> it really yeah, is. Yeah. Oh, thanks, mate. That's amazing. Yeah. If there's a symbol of the immense human pressure on this crowded coast, it's the new Kopu Bridge at Thames. It will allow even faster access to the enticing beaches of the Coromandel Peninsula like Pawa Nui. An ocean beach halfway up the Coromandel with an easy travelling distance of New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, Pawa Nui is a subdivision partly designed around the attractions of the beach. Coastal development expert Rowan Peart has written a book about development on the coast. Pawa Nui was a planned development, so that was something quite different. Uh, the developers bought up the whole sand spit, which had been covered in pine trees, and they uh, really brought over the idea of the garden city. This was an American idea. And so that's why you'll see all these green spaces and really the idea is the houses would be set amongst parkland. And that parkland's public space that people can enjoy. So it was quite a new idea really in New Zealand at the time. This was in the 1960s. Um, but then that developed and I think we've seen further up the estuary the canal development. Well that was a 1990s idea. And you can see that's quite a different concept. This, to me, is quite extraordinary. I don't have anything like this in the South Island that I could compare it to. It's Auckland come south, is it? It is. This is really um, the Gold Coast come to New Zealand. If you go to the Gold Coast, there's kilometres and kilometres of canal developments, and they look very much like this. As you see, it's a very artificially created, you know, waterfront, sea walls, very little public access, if any. I'm making a program called Wild Coast. This is about as far away as a wild coast as I can get. Yeah, you'll be right there. And that gives me a funny feeling as a sort of Kiwi that uh, likes to go to a wild beach first and foremost. Yeah. But I guess it caters for a certain taste. More people are coming to the coast, the population's increasing, we're seeing more permanent developments. Um, where is it all heading? Well, I think the key here is we've got past the point where we can just kind of sit back and let it happen. And I think we've really kind of hit that tipping point that our population is now getting to a size where we are getting conflicts, we are losing things that are important, and we've just got to be much more proactive at managing them. Otherwise, we'll lose, you know, these things that are really important to us all. And here's the rub. If you want to have suburbia by the sea, you want to have good ocean views, maybe buy an ice cream at a shop close by, you change the essence of the beach. Everything in nature is connected, and changing the coastal fringe can cause adverse effects. Take away the plants, and there's no longer a home for the insects. No place for the birds. So bit by bit, we lose the marvels of nature that are so precious to us, and we're much of the attraction of the beach in the first place. Let's go back to the start. 
to a place where new coast is being made in the turmoil of a risen sea volcano. Well, this is White Island. It's a very, very active volcano sitting off the coast of New Zealand. And it was over 20 years ago that I was here last. It's changed a lot. I guess it just keeps changing. It shows just how absolutely dynamic some parts of New Zealand coastline are. White Island sits on the edge and offshore of the Taupo volcanic zone. Over the millennia, many volcanoes from White Island to Ruapeu to Taupo have poured ash onto the area, feeding the fertile lands and truly making it the Bay of Plenty. I'm here to meet volcanologist Brad Scott to get some expert insight into this dynamic place. Well, Brad, this is White Island, but not as I used to know it. I mean, when I first came up, you looked right over a very deep lip, went a long way down. It's full of water now. Yeah, when you were here, the volcano was active, it was erupting, so it was reaming out a hole, digging a really big hole. Since then, it's cooled down, um, it's stopped evaporating water, and basically now the water's condensed, and it's filled up with water, and we now have an active crater lake, same as Ruapehu. So what's the temperature of that lake now? It looks pretty hot, steaming. Yeah, it's quite warm. Um, last time we measured it, it was 57 degrees Celsius. So it's quite hot. Yeah, but you can almost swim in it if it just comes down a little bit more. Well, maybe 42 I'd get into, <laughs> but not 57. But the pH of this might get you. Meaning it's acid, very acid. This lake's acidity is more than three times that of a car battery. For most living creatures, a swim in this lake would mean certain death. Yet scientists have made a significant discovery. In volcanic lakes, primordial life forms have been found. When this lake first started to establish itself, our extremophile scientists came here. And Sorry, started... extremophile? Extremophile, yeah, these are bugs and things that live in extreme environments. And there's a group of people in the research centre that study those. And they came here when the lake first formed and they actually found extremophiles living in this crater lake. These are in crudely hostile environments, and yet we're finding these really basic life forms. And they're really primitive, and yeah, things could have evolved from there. White Island will always be a hostile environment, yet it is this wild, untamable spirit that draws many visitors to this place. It's a dynamic, different environment. Adventure tourism, New Zealand's famous for that, and this is just one of the major draw cards. You have the boat trip out, you're crossing a river bar, getting ashore in a rubber duck. And then, and then you get gassed and... <laughs> <laughs> then you get gassed. <laughs> How hot have we got here? What's happening here? Um, this fuel roll here is just over 100 degrees C, maybe 110, 115 degrees Celsius. And it's just quietly discharging away, mainly water and CO2 gas. You're saying quietly discharging. That's a very active discharge for anyone that walks up and sees it. Uh, for White Island, this is passive. Really? Yeah, yeah, this has been a lot, lot more active in the past. I might just take a photograph before we move okay. on. OK, yes. go for it. I'm really fascinated by these places. I have to go now, but I guess I'll keep coming back to geothermal areas like White Island, because this possibly is where geology became biology, where rocks became life. It's a huge jump. I'm intrigued by it. I think we're all intrigued by it. Down on the gentler stretches of the coast, humans cluster around our holiday hotspots like Mount Monganui. With its subdivisions and high-rise developments, this is where the crowded coast begins. But it's further up the coast, in Auckland, where people pressure reaches its peak, where the tension between nature and humans is so obvious. Auckland, a million and a half people living on this piece of coast. All of them trying to get as close as possible to what they love, the sea. Auckland is the heart of this crowded coast, and its harbour is the heart of Auckland.
But even here, on a perfect Sunday morning, if you get up early, you can still have the harbour to yourself. I'm on one of the city's most famous old yachts, the Thelma, with a member of one of New Zealand's best-known sailing families, Tony Blake. Well, what a beautiful morning, Tony. We left the dock, there wasn't much wind, but what, what's it filling in at now? Oh, we've got about eight, ten knots now from the east. It's, yeah, just a stunning day. Beautiful. It's a beautiful old boat. It looked quite complex rigging it. You've got a lot of, you've got a lot of crew on board. Yes, well, to sail a boat like this uh, gaff rigger from 1897, we need a crew of 12 to 16, and primarily because we don't have any winches. So we need a lot of crew to pull in on the, all the sheets and the halyards. And the history of this boat? She was launched in 1897. Um, she was designed by Arch Logan of the famous Logan Brothers, and she was launched here in Auckland. She raced around Auckland right through till um, the beginning of the Second World War. And then in 1940, I think, or 41, the guy who owned it was a conscientious objector. He objected to the war, and he headed off overseas. <laughs> <laughs> and we bought her in 2006, I think it was. We brought her back here. We totally restored her. She wasn't in such good condition then. And four years ago, we relaunched her, and she's um, like she is today. Oh, she's beautiful. She's as she was in 1897. When I was a kid, I had a P-class. Then I had a, well, I had a sailing dinghy first, then a P-class, then a catamaran. And do you think I might just have a go on the tiller? Yes, a bit different to those, but no. <laughs> yeah, try <laughs> That's it. what I'd like to feel. Sure. Yeah, just how different. Um, it's a more substantial tiller. Substantially more substantial tiller. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> a much weightier helm. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. So sailing out on the Gulf, I mean, you've got this volcano behind you, Auckland's made of volcanoes. It's, it's a very special place, isn't it? Oh, it's a very special place. Wonderful cruising ground, wonderful sailing ground. It's, uh, it's one, I think it's one of the most spectacular sailing grounds in the world we've got here. Yeah. Can we go about soon and head back towards Rangitata? Sure. Take it, take it through the tank. Take it through? OK. Yep, definitely. Yep. And that's going to be... Yep, just ready gonna... about. And we're going to head back to Rangitoto, so we'll ease off on the Port runners, please leave the starboard runners. Okay, let, let go of the runners, please, Tessie and Jeff. We're heading to Rangitoto. That's an amazing place. Right next to our largest city is a volcano that came out of the sea just 600 years ago. Symmetrical from every angle, Rangitoto is one of the most striking features of the Hauraki Gulf. And from the air, it forms an almost perfect circle. A volcano erupting on your doorstep is an Aucklander's worst nightmare. But for a small Naitai village on Motatapu Island, that is exactly what happened. You must be Marianne. Great. Nice to meet you. I'm Craig. And G'day, Craig. I'm Dave. Dave. Dave, hi. Until 600 years ago, there was just one island here, and then came Rangitoto. Crossing the causeway from Rangitoto to Motatapu, it's hard to imagine that Rangitoto arrived so recently. For archaeologist Dave Vert and Marion Turner, the Sundi site here on Motatapu tells the incredible story of Rangitoto's birth and the people who saw it happen. It's a totally extraordinary place. I mean, we've got people from the very beginning of humans living in New Zealand dealing with a catastrophic, catastrophic event, the eruption of that great big volcano over there, um, and then, then coming back to live later on. I mean, it's all there in the layers underneath our feet. So we've got to paint a picture. 600 years ago, suddenly the water starts boiling. Can you talk me through what you think happened when Rangitoto started to emerge? Because they were so attuned to the environment, they would have picked up on the signs and they would have known them from where they came. They mm. came from highly unstable volcanic environments. This would not have been new. They would have recognised them and known what to do. The most amazing thing for me is that the people standing right here on Motatapu left a clear record of themselves in the ash. And from one unassuming cross-section, we can get such a vivid sense of history that we can say what people were doing when Rangitoto burst forth. So you've got the settlement, the initial settlement at the bottom, you've got the initial eruption, you've got the footprints of the people and their dogs, 
and then you've got more volcanic material sitting on top of that. And so it's, it's just the sandwich of, of history trapped in that side of that beach there. It's that everyday nature of what you find as an archaeologist that makes the site different because we're dealing with people doing the everyday things and then bang, they're suddenly yeah. dealing with something totally extraordinary. There's a bloody great volcano exploding right next door. Yeah. Yeah. In 1981, I'd just returned from London where I'd been working on Roman sites, and I came out here. It was the first archaeological excavation I'd ever seen in New Zealand, and it was totally extraordinary. They'd just found the footprints. Wow. And, and uh, Reg Nickel, who was excavating them, was filling them up with water so that, uh, you know, you could sort of see this perfect sort of outline of, of both dogs and humans. It was just a totally magical moment. And this is what they saw that day. I'd heard about the footprints here, and it was so moving to see a cast taken directly from them. You can see the dog prints alongside the humans. What's extraordinary here, some of the most important footprints in New Zealand have been left. Someone walked over the ashes after Rangitoto had erupted on the Sundi site that we've just been at, and they left these footprints it seems to me very important that we honour these coastal walkers. For me to see this here on site, it's a very special moment. In the Second World War, the Americans named one of their beachheads Omaha in the landings of Normandy. Over there, it was a real battle. There's one going on here to save the New Zealand Dottrell. Let's hope the good guys win. Omaha, just north of Auckland, is well known as a holiday resort. Even the Prime Minister, John Key, has a place here. And sharing the same beach is a group of New Zealand's rarest and most vulnerable little birds, the Dotterels. Like the Godwits, the Dotterels have been coming here for longer than humans have been in New Zealand. But now there are fewer than 2,000 of them left. They nest in the open among the beach stones, and thus they don't cope well in this new world full of dogs and cats, quad bikes and cars. Fortunately, they have champions like Marie Ward and Jill Stone. I think we relate to them because they seem to reflect a lot of the values or characteristics that humans have. Um, and we're really, so vain. <laughs> they're beautiful for a start, and because they're such wonderful parents. We now know that these birds can live perhaps into their 40s. I mean, a lot of them stay together in their pair for all those years. I wonder how they select their partners. <laughs> they, you know, I find that intriguing. They just seem to me to be standing there on one leg, resting, but they're obviously sussing out the, op <laughs> the opposite, sex. opposite sex. But I think they're quite canny about what would be a particular area that's likely to be easily defended. They like to be near where the variable oyster catchers are because the oyster catchers are quite big, aggressive birds and noisy, and they will um, defend their territory. And the dotterels sort of overlap with the... They seem to get on quite well together. One reason we're focusing on the dotterels and focusing here and putting so much effort, I mean, you drive up from Auckland to do this work, is because they are endangered now. now one of the things about these birds is that the male sits on the nest, which is just a scrape in the sand. Mm -hmm the male sits on the eggs at night. Mm. So the female is off the nest then feeding. And so the male is very vulnerable. How do you answer the good folk of Omaha that have got their launches and make lots of noise with their jet skis? You know, do you shake your fist at them? Do you try to be nice to them? How do you, how do you get around this? Well, well, we try to get them to understand that what makes this area so beautiful, it's the things that we take for granted. It's the birds. Until they're gone, you don't realise how much you appreciate them. Just over the hill from Omaha is a marine reserve at Goat Island. It has 300,000 visitors a year, but this is my first visit and it's long overdue. For us conservationists and for historians, what happened here in 1975 rearranged our relationship to the ocean. 
and very importantly, it was here that the first no-take marine reserve was created in the world. And New Zealand did it. We gave women the vote first, and we went nuclear-free first. Makes me very proud that we were the first country to set aside a body of ocean and say, just let it be. As a kid, rock pools just fascinated me and began my love affair with the sea. And for a scientist like John Walsby, they're still the main attraction. I think that we should find some good things amongst here. Oh, yeah. And there's the little crab that's just gone under that boulder. <laughs> Not so little, though. The crab is very, very closely related to a crayfish. And a crayfish is shaped like a torpedo, but a really long crayfish-type tail out the back it would become a nuisance when you wanted to duck back underneath a boulder. So instead, you change your body shape to wide at the front, tapering at the back, so you can then back into uh, a space underneath a boulder. Now, the tail would be a nuisance. So instead of doing that, it now takes its, it takes its tail from under here and tucks it up underneath its body. And here it is, tucked up there. Yeah. I'm just being a little bit indelicate here. No lady likes to have her, tail her underparts up. shown. Mm -hmm. and, but here, she has a large tail, mm -hmm. and her appendages on the tail are long, are numerous, yeah. and hairy. They are like little feathers. They're clinging together now like our wet hair does, but underwater, they open out like plumes of feathers. And this is because at this point just there are where her eggs come out. And then they're captured by the hairy legs and held underneath her tail. So she might hold five to 10,000 eggs underneath oh. here. And she does that to protect them until they hatch because everybody likes eggs on the shore and they would otherwise get eaten if she right, abandons right. them. Well, I can assure you no crabs were actually harmed in the making of this program, but they were severely compromised in parts. <laughs> Quite a lot of animals live underneath these boulders and they hide at this time. There's lots of chitons. Look at this one. This is the racehorse chiton here, uh, the fastest chiton on the shore. <laughs> he's going for it now. And he's going for it because, you see, they have eyes in the backs of their shells so that they can tell whether they're exposed to the light. And all of these little chitons are running away. He's going for the shade. He's going for the shade. Yep. And the beauty of having a shell with eight shell yeah, plates okay. is that it can hinge like yeah. the armour plating on an old su suit of armour around the elbow and the shoulder. Well, you're starting to get quite personal with these creatures. I mean, you've been studying them for years and years and years. Oh, look at this. It, does it become a... No, let, don't dodge your question. Does it become a personal obsession? Oh, I'm definitely obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> what are you actually obsessed with in the pool? Just all the magic of the, the life going on here. I mean, look at this. This is just marvellous. Yeah, yeah. There's a starfish here. But this tells us a fantastic story. Now, occasionally, two legs on opposite sides will say they want to be leaders. So if that leg and that leg were our leaders, the animal will then tear itself in half. No. It's remarkable. And this is what has happened to this one. And now this half is replacing the legs that it lost. So there's another half And the other here. half has crawled away somewhere else, and that Making is also it. replacing its legs. So in this area, this starfish is now able to reproduce take advantage of the good condition and produce two starfish out of one. So two halves make two holes. Two halves make two holes is a rewriting of mathematics. Yes, big tanks. Oh, this looks like a nice pool. It's wonderful to think that this place, the first marine protected no-take reserve in the world, has been set aside here at Lee and we can all come forever and see it in its pristine state. When I was an adolescent and started snorkeling, there was a book that I uh, almost had as a Bible. It was by Wade and Jan Doak, and it was called Beneath New Zealand Seas. This book here, in fact. It's amazing how just one book can have such an impact. He introduced not just me, but a whole lot of New Zealanders to this magical world that exists under the sea. Wade Doak is one of New Zealand's grand old men of the sea and a strong advocate for marine reserves. I like to think of him as Al Cousteau and I've been promising to visit him here at his home for over 20 years. It's worth waiting. It's it worth waiting. Oh, well, this, I should have come yeah. earlier. This is stunning. This is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? What a magnificent... Wade used to be an underwater diver, spear fisherman and treasure hunter, but he soon discovered we were destroying the treasures of the living ocean. All the information's coming in that we have overfished not only our own seas, not only commercially but recreationally, but the world's oceans. So we bring that back to New Zealand and say, well, what can we do here? What, what can we do? Yes, well, 
I also have the fortune to have seen the changes at the Poor Night since it was made a marine reserve. It was made a marine reserve in, in 1981, which is 32 years ago. But only 13 years ago did we get our act together and make it a total no-take marine reserve. And that's when it started to happen. A lot of New Zealanders would just find it very difficult to give up that recreational fishing side of their existence. I mean, can it live side by side with marine reserves? You're arguing, yes, it can. Yes, uh, if we approach our fishing with a very, very strong conservation ethic in a sustainable way, and I'm afraid that uh, exporting fish to to, uh, to China in order to have it filleted and sent back, which is what we're doing with Teriki right now, is not really part of the recipe. The end of a long, lovely day is a good chance to catch up with an old mate and prepare myself for an early morning trip out to the poor nights. This coast is one of the first places in the world to catch the sunrise. I'd been told the view from Tutakaka Heads was beautiful, so I thought I'd get up early to see it. Just out there on the horizon are the famous Poor Knights Islands, and that's where I'm heading. Love being out in the ocean like this ever since I was a little kid. It actually reminds me of being with my dad. We just love boats. Now, my dad, he'd be thinking, how's the engine going? You know, is the prop spinning right? Is the torque right? But I'd always be looking out for seabirds. I just love being out here. The poor nights are the eroded remnants of a four million year old volcano, long extinct, but still the most dramatic landmark on the northeast coast. For many years, this was like a second home for Wade and his wife, Jan. Well, we actually got to know you folk first, maybe 1970s, that particular time, when, yes. when you were doing a lot of dolphin work. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely fascinated yeah. by the fact that you made a suit that mimicked what a dolphin might move within the water. Mm. And we've gone back in the history vaults and found that suit today, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> we felt that with the dolphins, since we're the ones with the opposing thumb that can make things, we had to meet them more than halfway, adapt to some of their body language, and then see what, what happened. <laughs> there was no way I was going to fit into Jan's full dolphin suit, but I wanted to try the tail. Wade's theory that if we try swimming with dolphins, we should try to mimic them really appeals to me. Got it all wrong. <laughs> You got it all wrong. Yeah, tell me. The movement starts at your head. Just imagine you're a piece of rope when we make ripples along it, right? Right. So the movement starts at your head. Head. And you've got to flow. Yeah, a bit, that's a bit better. You just need Pink Floyd now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The only dolphin that I was swimming with today, though, was Wade. He's starting to slow down on the land, but underwater he still moves through the sea so gracefully. I'm in awe of his love, knowledge, and endless enthusiasm for this underwater world. I've got a couple of mates down here. They are the keystones that hold that whole ecological archway together. One of them is a red moki. He's got no teeth, doesn't take a hook, but he's not a, he's not a vegetarian. No. He, he's a bottom kisser. 
and he goes up to the bottom and kisses off a piece of encrusting algal turf. Inside that turf are thousands of tiny sea urchin eggs that if left to grow would devour everything, potentially creating an urchin wasteland. The other one is that weird little fish, the leather jacket. He is like the wrecker's ball. He comes along and bites the bottom everywhere at least once a year. The leather jacket spreads undersea larvae like a bird, helping prevent any one species from dominating. That's why we have such a wonderful mosaic of life. He's the diversifier. Right, right. We only should be taking the fishes that are in the immediate stage. Right. Leave the big old boys and girls around. Yeah. Since the reserve has had full no-take status, the snapper have increased dramatically. The Tornites, they're not just another dive spot, they're actually a mecca. And the reason they are is that there's a warm tropical current flowing down from the north. That makes it very productive. It also brings in creatures that aren't found in other places like sea turtles. The other thing about Tornites is that they're made of very solid ignimbrite rock, like I've got behind me here. And that continues right down under the sea and it makes a ladder just straight down to quite deep depths. In other places you'd have to go out a long way to get that same stratification. So it's a very special place. Even these distant rocky outposts were once occupied and now the descendants of those people bring outsiders to the poor nights to dive. What do we know about the Maori occupation of the island? Uh, well, we know that there were people who lived here. Mm -hmm. um, there was over 400 people who lived here. Um, and right over this cliff top here, there's a nice big valley on the other side, and that's where they had their um, main settlement. Some of them lived here throughout the whole year, and then some of them only lived here seasonally. Knowing that my ancestors did come from here and live on the islands is quite special to me. Also, the place itself, as you can see, it's, it's beautiful, and I enjoy coming out here every single time. There's not many places which are actually getting better in the marine environment. You know, this, this place really bucks the trend. Uh, you go to places, you, you talk of uh, states of decline, you know, fisheries in a state of decline. This place is coming up, it's getting better. And we're hearing stories nowadays where you've seen it today, where we're swimming around out here and you're seeing uh, snapper tails coming out of the water. That's old people's stories. You know, that's, that's going back a you know, generation. That's my grandfather's time, listening to those stories. That's the stories they used to tell. So for us to you know, sit here in 2011 and be able to uh, say the same stories, that's cool, that's cool. The next stop on my journey north is Matauri Bay. There's another great diving spot out off the coast, but that's not why I'm stopping. I'm keen to pay homage to a sculpture, a work of art here on the coast that's a monument to a sad chapter in our history. The sculpture behind me is by Chris Booth. He's one of our best sculptors, and he's trying to talk in quite difficult ways about the scuttling of the Rainbow Warrior. It's just out there. It was the flagship of Greenpeace, and it was sent to Mururoa Atoll, a French testing site for atmospheric nuclear bombs. That testing was releasing strontium-90 into the atmosphere. Strontium-90 is found in every single living organism on the planet. It's found in all the fish out here. It's in you and me. There's a direct result of that testing. Chris, like me, is just enraged by that sort of activity, but he's tried to make a quiet tribute to the people who tried to stop that through their protest. On the 10th of July, 1985, the Rainbow Warrior was bombed by French agents in Auckland Harbour. It was the only act of international terrorism ever committed in New Zealand. On December the 2nd, 1987, she was brought here to Matauri Bay for a fitting farewell to be turned into a living reef. Those events make it all the more important to acknowledge and protect our coastal treasures. Tomorrow, I will explore one of mainland New Zealand's most isolated and beautiful harbours. Well, it's early morning. We're on the Paringaringa Harbour. It's our northernmost harbour in New Zealand, and it's one of our least modified, one I've often wanted to come to but never got to before. And I'm here to meet Mike Bradstock. Come on, Craig, time to go. Cool. Mike. 
Mike's an old mate and we've come to this glorious setting in the far north Paringaringa Harbour. It's a cradle for sea life, as bountiful as the poor nights in its serene way. Mike sees things that most people never notice. I mean, is there life even in there? Yes, there is. There's a whole suite of small animals that live in sand. They're all very important in the food chains because they're eaten by things slightly larger than themselves and become food for something else. So what's this beautiful little thing, Mike? Well, that's a hydroid. Believe it or not, that's an animal, not a seaweed. I mean, how do you know that's an animal? Well, I've looked them under a microscope. <laughs> All right. As a young scientist, Mike spent three months walking around the top of the North Island, but he got stuck on the other side of this harbour. And somewhere over about there, yep. at low tide, I did the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life, I think, and that was I put my pack into a big plastic bag and I swam across the harbour. I probably got out about here, actually. On your own? On my own, yeah, little realising yeah. that this place is notorious for sharks and so on. I didn't, never saw a shark the whole trip, uh, but no, I can wait a minute. You're a marine biologist, you say mm. little realising. I mean, is this not thinking? Uh, <laughs> of course there'd be well, sharks perhaps, here. Perhaps I was a bit of an optimist, but as you can see, I didn't, didn't, get, didn't lose a leg on the way. <laughs> Sharp teeth don't put off these locals. And despite the fact sharks have often been seen from this wharf, I thought I'd better represent the South Island for a couple of bombs. <laughs> Tahapua is the northernmost town of New Zealand. It's small, few people live here, and those who do mostly live lightly on the edge of this beautiful coast, which means the harbour is in relatively good condition. That makes it all the more important as an essential nursery at the top of the crowded coast. All these rays hunting here show just how abundant the fish life is. Without harbours like this, there would be virtually no fish, and it all starts with the mangrove. Almost every other plant that I know had this much salt water around it. Be dead, it's gone. Yep, but the mangrove is adapted to live in seawater. An amazing adaptation. It can even secrete salt off its leaves. And people say that these places are almost as productive as tropical rainforests, just in terms of biodiversity, just meaning the amount of life in them. I mean, is, is that so, or is that a bit of an exaggeration? Oh, it's not exaggerated at all, Craig. I mean, estuaries produce more than the best pasture. They'll be the dairy farm, hands down. They've adapted to live in a really crazy way. This mud is thick and waterlogged, so mangroves send up these spiky aerial roots like snorkels and wait for low tide to get their oxygen fix. What I love is we get to head down for a while, the whole sense of scale completely changes. Indeed, and of course, when you're swimming in the forest, it's kind of like flying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah, hovering over the top of the mm. canopy. You're under the water, obviously, but mm. you haven't got strong currents or anything. Very gentle. Well, it's a beautiful sheltered place yeah. for small animals to live a quiet life. Yeah. Absolutely. And for the young and bigger animals to get a chance to grow to a decent size. So this whole place is a nursery for fish that are important to us, you know, economically and recreationally. Fish like mullet and the young trevally. The dive was quite wonderful. I felt as I was actually floating above a forest. But if I admit it, actually the amount of life in there, I didn't see it until Mike started pointing it out. And it's thanks to people like Mike and the study they do in these areas that we can understand just how highly productive these places are. See ya. See ya, Mike. See you next time. As I walk over these pure white dunes, I could be in the Sahara.
Well, I've reached the end of an extraordinary journey. I started on a live volcano. I went through whole settlements of people trying to understand what it is that we have to do to preserve the coast and yet be able to use the coast. But I've come to the end to the most extraordinary place of wilderness. It's Paringaringa Harbour. These are glorious white sands, whiter than white, whiter than I've ever photographed before. And I've just had an evening that I wouldn't swap for anything in the world, just to be here on my own, taking photographs. What a wonderful way to finish a great coastal journey.